I compiled this video last night featuring the deadliest real life animal attacks covered on the channel thus far. These stories include the true story of a man who was envenomated by a decapitated rattlesnake, an African villager's recent fatal hyena encounter, a brutal chimpanzee attack, and much more. Hit that like and subscribe button if you're new. You're watching the world's deadliest animal attacks. Found mainly in the Americas, Western Diamondback rattlesnakes are creatures that strike fear in even the bravest of souls. They're one of the most well-known reptiles in the American Southwest, along with venomous spiders, scorpions, and several species of venomous lizards, a majority of which have the potential to inflict serious, or in some cases, even lethal injury to humans. The region additionally hosts a variety of large predators, including mountain lions, black bears, and coyotes, all of which, of course, can also pose a danger to humans under the right circumstances. The risks associated with the wildlife in this region were demonstrated in 2018 when Jeremy Sutcliffe, a resident of Corpus Christi, Texas, was helping his wife with some yard work when he'd stumbled upon a four-foot-long rattlesnake, an encounter that would change the course of his life forever. According to the World Health Organization, an estimated 5.4 million snake bites occur worldwide each year, with up to 2.7 million resulting in envenomation. Of these cases, approximately 138,000 result in death and around 400,000 in permanent disability. And comparatively, while the 7 to 8,000 annually reported snake bites in the US may seem like a high number, it most certainly of course pales in comparison to the global statistics, and not to mention highlights the need for greater attention to be paid to snake bite management and prevention, especially in more affected regions. On what started out as a peaceful day on May 14th of 2018, young and happily married Texas couple Jeremy and Jennifer Sutcliffe were doing some yard work ahead of a family barbecue set for later that afternoon. However, their peaceful day was just minutes into it disrupted when Jennifer would stumble upon a large western diamondback rattlesnake in the couple's garden, and this rattler measured over a meter in length. The snake quickly got in striking position, its tail rattling with aggression, prompting Jennifer to immediately start screaming for help. Her husband Jeremy, who was used to dealing with non-venomous rat snakes, meanwhile rushes to her aid with a shovel, hoping he could just scoop it out of harm's way. As Jennifer finds herself trapped between the wall of the house and a thicket of shrubs, Unable to move with the rattlesnake once again in striking distance, she remains motionless, knowing that one wrong move could result in potentially lethal consequences. After a few seconds of what felt like an eternity, Jeremy finally arrives at the scene and approaches the snake with his shovel, which is when he attempts to scoop it up. He would, however, quickly realize that its large size made this task much easier said than done. After several failed attempts, a frustrated Jeremy would then resort to a much more drastic measure and swings the edge of the shovel down with force, decapitating the snake. Relieved that the snake was neutralized, a shaken up Jennifer after witnessing this goes inside to calm down while Jeremy sorted out how he was going to dispose of the body. Concerned that their dogs might mess with it, Jeremy then impulsively decides to remove the over a meter long rattler by hand, unaware of the still very present dangers of doing so. Just as he bent down to pick up the head of the snake is when the unthinkable would happen, as the snake instinctually jumped in the air, managing to sink its fangs into his hand, and faster than the blink of an eye, it would rapidly inject what was likely its entire venom sac into his fingers. It's important to note that even after decapitation, a rattlesnake's head can still continue to function due to a reflex mechanism controlled by the brainstem. This reflex can be triggered by any perceived threat or stimulation, making it a significant danger to humans who mistakenly believe that a decapitated snake can pose one no harm. Jennifer, in a panic, knowing the situation was serious, immediately dialed 911 as she rushed her husband to the local hospital by car. It is during this time that Jeremy begins seizing and passing out as the swollen and blistered bite site continued to worsen by the minute. It was at about a quarter way to the hospital that Jeremy barely manages to communicate through severely slurred speech that he can no longer see. 
Jennifer was forced to pull over and ask the 911 operator that she was on the phone with to promptly send an ambulance to their location. Fortunately, the medics arrive within just minutes and Jeremy is then airlifted to a hospital via helicopter where his life would hang in the balance. The venom of rattlesnakes can cause varying effects on the human body, with the western diamondback being particularly potent due to its mixture of enzymes and toxins, which include myotoxins, hemotoxins, as well as neurotoxins. These toxins can cause significant damage to the body, such as damage to muscles and tissue in the bite area, internal bleeding, as well as affect the nervous system. Immediate symptoms can include weakness, numbness, tingling, and a rapid heartbeat, with severe cases potentially leading to paralysis, respiratory failure, and even death. After a brief examination, doctors informed Jennifer that Jeremy was in critical condition and that there was a chance that this bite could prove fatal, and this was despite him having received a significant amount of a powerful antivenom known as Crofap. For western diamondback rattlesnake bites, antivenom can help neutralize the venom and reduce the severity of symptoms, improving the chances of recovery. A few hours later, Jeremy's kidneys would begin to give in to the shock of the venom, requiring immediate dialysis and various antibiotics to keep him alive. He was then dosed with 26 doses of the expensive antidote to help combat the superdose of venom that he'd received. Shortly after the incident took place, his story would go viral, leaving many in disbelief at the idea of a beheaded snake still being able to bite. Meanwhile, Jeremy continued to fight unable to stand and requiring significant medical attention. The cost of the antivenom and medical expenses already tallying about 60,000 US dollars. The Sutcliffs would resort to starting a GoFundMe campaign in order to help cover the expenses, highlighting even more the unfortunate reality of healthcare costs in the US. Jennifer then gets word from the doctors that two of Jeremy's fingers are so badly damaged that amputation was necessary. Jeremy, despite this news, would remain optimistic upon hearing it and consider this a small sacrifice compared to what was potentially a fatal outcome, and so would continue to battle through a grueling recovery process with everything that he had in him. It wasn't until after about a month that Jeremy's determination would finally pay off as his kidneys would begin to function again, providing the doctors and his family with hope for his recovery. And a couple of weeks later, by late June, he would be released from the hospital and return to their dream home in progress, which is when the Sutcliffs were finally able to enjoy their aforementioned long-awaited family barbecue. According to experts, taking precautions is crucial to avoiding snake bites. In fact, a study published in the Wilderness and Environmental Medicine Journal found that wearing long pants and boots reduced the risk of snake bites by up to 85%. Additionally, the use of a flashlight at night can also significantly reduce the risk of stepping on a snake. Avoiding areas where snakes may be hiding, such as tall grass or piles of leaves, is also important. As David Seberg, president of the America College of Emergency Physicians, explained, Rattlesnakes like to hide in places like rock piles, wood piles, and tall grass, so you must be careful when you're walking around in these areas. You have to keep your eyes peeled for snakes and make sure you give them plenty of space if you do see one. Jeremy's near-fatal encounter also serves till this day as a stark reminder of the importance of leaving dead snakes alone and ensuring to call for professional help in order to remove them from your property. Snakes are an important part of the ecosystem and they help keep rodent populations in check. By staying aware of your surroundings and taking appropriate precautions, it's possible to minimize the risk of snake bite and enjoy the beauty and wonders of the natural world while preserving these important species as well as ourselves. Hyenas are amongst the most feared animals in Africa, and despite being primarily known as scavengers, they are on the contrary highly skilled predators that are capable of utilizing their underrated intellect and social skills to work in unison in order to take down prey much larger than themselves. Unfortunately, it's also a well-known fact that their prey items include humans, and this happens especially in rural areas of the regions they inhabit. And although hyenas typically fear and or avoid people in most circumstances, they have been known to attack and in many cases kill a number of vulnerable individuals such as children, women, and frail men on an annual basis. The following video highlights one such incident which saw the life of 87-year-old Tendai Maseka come to a gruesome end when he'd fall victim to a clan of spotted hyenas 
on November of 2020. Zimbabwe is a landlocked country located in southern Africa. It is a diverse economy with agriculture, mining, and tourism being some of its main industries. It's renowned for its production of tobacco, cotton, and maize, as well as its vast reserves of minerals such as gold, platinum, and diamonds. The country's topography is varied with a mixture of highlands, plateaus, and lowlands. The eastern part of the country is dominated by the eastern highlands, which include the Nyanga Mountains, the Mvumba Mountains, and the Chimanimani Mountains. These highlands are covered in dense forests and offer spectacular views of valleys and waterfalls, while the central plateau is generally flat with grasslands and savannas. And the famous Zambezi River forms the country's northern border and also includes the spectacular Victoria Falls. Home to several national parks, Zimbabwe is also famous for its diverse and abundant wildlife. The country hosts several large mammals, including elephants, lions, leopards, rhinoceroses, buffaloes, and of course, the spotted hyena. Hyenas are known to inhabit various habitats in Zimbabwe, including savannas, woodlands, and rocky outcrops. In many rural areas, hyenas are viewed as a threat to livestock and people, and conflicts between humans and hyenas continue to occur in many of them. Hyenas are known to attack and kill livestock such as goats, sheep, and cattle, which in turn causes financial losses for these local farmers. However, hyenas also play an extremely important role in Zimbabwe's ecosystems. They're scavengers and help to clean up dead animal carcasses, which can reduce the risk of disease transmission, as well as maintain optimal health for their habitats. Additionally, hyenas are apex predators and help to control populations of herbivores, such as impalas and zebras, which can prevent overgrazing, which once again contributes to the overall balance of their habitats. Despite their significance to the ecosystems that they inhabit, however, these highly capable predators are also widely feared throughout the country. And out of the reported 60 human lives claimed by wild animals in Zimbabwe in 2020 alone, spotted hyenas are most certainly responsible for a decent percentage of them. On November 20th, 2020, Tendai Maseka, an 87-year-old man, had been drinking beer at a local bar before walking home alone in the dark. Since the COVID-19 pandemic had halted tourism in the area, life had become increasingly difficult financially, with money being scarce even by normal standards, which in comparison to let's say a western country, is still earth and sky. The dry season had heightened tensions in the savanna between the wild animals, and reports of missing goats and cattle from farmers had been increasing. Tendai was familiar with the cycle of competition for prey that occurred during the dry season, but this wasn't going to stop a man who was, according to reports, highly physically active for his age. Unbeknownst to Tendai, as he was walking home from the local bar, he was being followed by a clan of hyenas who were searching for food as the aforementioned dry season had emptied their territory of their usual prey. It's important to note that hyenas are well known for their opportunistic hunting tactics, which typically involve both stalking and scavenging. They're primarily nocturnal and use their keen sense of smell to locate potential prey. And once locked on, they will often follow their prey for long distances, while effectively using their low-slung bodies to stay hidden in the grass, and they will often approach from behind to avoid being seen, which is when they wait for the right moment to strike. Perhaps due to the few beers he had consumed, Tendai would forget to properly secure his mud hut door upon arriving home. And of course the hyenas who were stalking him this whole time would see this as an opportunity. Once he'd fallen asleep, the clever hyenas would then approach his home, lured by his scent, and would latch onto and drag the helpless 87-year-old man about 300 meters away from his hut before finally killing him. The next morning, a horrified neighbor would find Tendai's severed head near his hut, and an inspection of the area would reveal his arms and evidence of the hyena tracks. After following a trail of tracks, shredded clothing, and spots of blood for some time, the men would eventually arrive at the spot where the clan began devouring Tendai's body overnight, leaving scattered tracks, pieces of flesh, and scat throughout the scene. As the men followed the drag trail, they would observe that the hyena clan seemed to have been gnawing off Tendai's limbs from the bottom up as they dragged him away from his hut. Just after the discovery of Tendai's mutilated body, 
government hunters were immediately dispatched to eliminate the suspect clan of what was said to have consisted of approximately six hyenas in the area, which were said to have been a known clan that were attacking livestock. Mr. Tanashe Farawo, a spokesman for Zim Parks, would the very next month confirm that two of the hyenas were indeed killed, with no updated reports indicating whether they were successful in capturing the remaining four. Meanwhile, locals were urged to be vigilant and keep all doors and windows closed until the hyenas were captured. Farawa would also state that animal attacks were not uncommon during the summer, particularly during the drier months when food and water are scarcer than usual, and animals knowing this move long distances during this time in search of food. Farawa also mentioned that had they had enough resources, they would have translocated the animals from overpopulated areas to more remote regions instead of killing them. According to him, the root cause of these attacks is primarily due to the overpopulation of predators, which has been exacerbated by the impact of climate change on their habitats. All these factors combined, of course, increases the risk of more dangerous human-animal encounters. If you ever find yourself in hyena territory for whatever reason, it's best to take precautions when camping or hiking in areas where hyenas are known to live. First and foremost, it's important not to leave any food or garbage out in the open, as this can attract them. It's also recommended to camp in designated areas with proper fencing or barriers to keep hyenas out. If you do happen to encounter one, it's important to remain calm and avoid running away as this, much like dogs, can trigger their hunting instinct. Instead, try to make yourself appear as large and intimidating as possible by raising your arms, shouting loudly, and banging pots or pans together to scare them off just like you would a bear. If you do get attacked, it's important to fight back aggressively, targeting the head and the throat as these are the hyena's most vulnerable areas. In a small town in North Carolina, Chelsea Ann McKinney, a dedicated housewife, was looking forward to spending their school holidays with her two children, eight-year-old Kiona and 14-year-old honor roll student, Matthew. As the summer of 2021 kicked off, the kids were excited about their break from school. However, little did they know that danger lurked beneath the surface of a nearby lake. On June 15, 2021, Chelsea Ann decided to take her children, along with the neighbor's kids and Matthew's friends, James and Michael, to the lake. They spent the day enjoying the sun, diving, and playing in the water. That night, an exhausted Matthew went to bed early, completely unaware of the looming danger he was about to face. At 2 a.m. on the same night, Matthew awoke feeling feverish, experiencing pain in his nose. Chelsea Ann, worried by his temperature, which was at a whopping 103.6 degrees Fahrenheit, immediately got Kiona ready and drove her and Matthew to the local hospital. As soon as they checked Matthew in, the doctors, suspecting sinusitis, prescribed antibiotics and sent the family home. Over the next three days, Chelsea Ann took care of Matthew to the best of her ability, growing increasingly concerned as she noticed swelling that was around his left eye and nose progressively worsen. A couple of days later on June 19th, Matthew alerts his mother to a frightening development. His teeth seem to be moving, with one tooth noticeably out of alignment. Chelsea Ann rushed Matthew back to the hospital, where doctors, still suspecting severe sinusitis, attempted to drain his sinuses. Finding that they were dry, they would then admit Matthew for further testing. The tests revealed alarming gum swelling and pus surrounding his loose teeth. Desperate to uncover the cause of Matthew's condition, doctors then took a biopsy of his gum tissue. As they awaited the test results, Chelsea Ann would notice small black spots begin forming around his left nostril, a sign of dying flesh. Fearing for her son's life, the desperate mother then agrees to have Matthew transferred by helicopter to a specialist unit 80 kilometers away. Dr. William Shockley and his medical team would then assess Matthew's condition upon arrival. They noted a high fever, rapid pulse, and disorientation, suspecting septic shock caused by an unidentified bacterial infection. A couple of days later, on June 21st, the surgical team removed dead tissue from Matthew's nose, as well as his gums and his palate. Infectious disease expert Dr. Tom Bellhorn would then join the case, determined to find the origin of the rapidly spreading infection. It was around this time that the test results would finally arrive, revealing the cause of Matthew's sufferings. Chromobacterium 
violaceum, a rare flesh-eating bacteria found in tropical and subtropical environments. Chromobacterium violaceum produces a potent toxin called violacine. This toxin damages the body's tissues, leading to the destruction of skin, muscle, and even bone. When the bacteria invade the body, they release this toxin, which then triggers an inflammatory response and ultimately leads to tissue damage. Additionally, Chromobacterium violaceum is resistant to many antibiotics, making treatment challenging, which is why doctors often need to use a combination of antibiotics to combat the infection, and the choice of these depends on the patient's specific case. Despite this resistance, with timely and targeted treatment, the antibiotics can eventually help eliminate the bacteria and prevent further tissue damage. To add on to a rapidly growing list of concerns, Dr. Bellhorn would then discover through further testing that Matthew suffered from a weakened immune system due to chronic granulomatous disease, making him susceptible to the bacteria. Chronic granulomatous disease, otherwise known as CGD, is a rare genetic disorder that affects the immune system's ability to fight off certain types of bacteria and fungi. CGD causes the immune system's white blood cells to produce abnormal amounts of reactive oxygen species, or ROS, which are normally used to kill harmful bacteria and fungi. However, in people with CGD, the ROS levels are not sufficient enough to kill the bacteria, which allows the pathogens to grow and in turn, cause infections. As a result, it's fair to conclude that people with CGD are much more susceptible to bacterial and fungal infections in general, and the infections can thus be much more severe and difficult to treat. The doctors at this point who were even more curious about the case would begin to question Chelsea Ann about her and her family's whereabouts in the recent weeks. It was at this time that Chelsea Ann would recall their fateful trip to the lake on June 15th. She would then provide crucial information about how Matthew had come into contact with a deadly bacteria, prompting Dr. Bellhorn to promptly administer targeted intravenous antibiotics to Matthew. Antibiotics are drugs that are specifically designed to kill bacteria or prevent their growth. In Matthew's case, the specific antibiotics he was given were specifically meant to target the Chromobacterium violaceum bacteria that had infected him. The antibiotics work by either stopping the bacteria from growing, destroying the bacterial cell wall, or interfering with its protein synthesis. Once the bacteria are unable to grow or are destroyed, the body's immune system can then fight off any remaining bacteria and begin the process of healing. After four tense days of treatment with these antibiotics, the deadly bacteria would finally begin to recede, at which point Matthew was finally declared no longer in critical condition. And about a week later, the resilient 15-year-old was released from hospital and returned home to his family. Although the antibiotics successfully eradicated the bacteria, Matthew's face bore permanent scars. He underwent five reconstructive surgeries, including procedures to rebuild his nose. Matthew's case is one of the few reported cases of C. violaceum infection in the United States, and would go on to garner national attention due to the severity of his illness, as well as his remarkable recovery. His harrowing experience serves as a warning for all, especially those with weakened immune systems, to ensure that in order to minimize the risk of infection, it's recommended to avoid unchlorinated fresh water and damp soil when swimming in tropical or subtropical climates. After Matthew's survival, the McKinney family became dedicated advocates for spreading awareness of waterborne infections and the dangers associated with compromised immune systems. Through their participation in various campaigns and events, they educate the public till this day on proper water safety and hygiene practices. And Matthew's mother Chelsea Ann, now a passionate water safety advocate, proudly shares her son's story on social media, blogs, and local events to reach families who may be unaware of the risks and provide them with the knowledge to protect their loved ones. And despite his physical and mental scars, Matthew remains active in his community and inspires many through his resilience and determination. On February 16, 2009, a 200-pound chimpanzee named Travis would brutally attack his owner's friend, Charla Nash, resulting in permanent disfigurement and blindness. 
This horrific incident would not just raise ethical questions about keeping wild animals as pets, but would also serve as a prime example of just how deadly chimpanzees can be. Travis the Chimp was born on October 21, 1995, in the small town of Festus, Missouri. The Chimp was taken away from his mother at just three years old, before being purchased from a breeder by Jerome and Sandra Harold. The price tag? $50,000. The Harold family would go on to name their new pet after Sandra's favorite singer, James Travis. The Harolds' love for Chimps started about 25 years before this time, in the 1970s, when Sandra and her husband had amassed a substantial fortune through their various automotive ventures in Stamford, Connecticut, and would furthermore be widely regarded as highly accomplished entrepreneurs. However, despite their financial success, the couple had a pension for thrills and adventures, and would regularly traverse the country so that Sandra, and later her daughter Sue, could compete in semi-professional barrel racing events at various rodeos. And it was during one of these very ventures that Sandra would encounter two individuals who would go on to have a profound influence on her future. The first of these is when she'd met the young and free-spirited Charlotte Nash, who'd been making her way across the nation through a rodeo competition, from which point onwards the pair would be almost inseparable and become very good friends. However, it was during an extremely unique rodeo event that Sandra would have her second encounter, one where a charismatic chimpanzee, decked out in cowboy attire, would stun audiences by majestically galloping around the arena on horseback, an act that Sandra would become so entranced by that she'd managed to find a way backstage to meet the chimp and its owner after their performance. She would offer Travis some gummies, which he'd happily accept, and the chimp would go on to quickly warm up to her because of this kind gesture. Just a few days later, Sandra attends yet another show, during which the chimpanzee spots Sandra and the audience, and without hesitation, jumps off his horse and runs directly into her arms. And it was at this point that Sandra would become enamored by the prospect of keeping Travis as a pet. With Jerome having agreed to the adoption, Travis would thus become part of the family, from bottle feeding and burping, to even tucking him into a crib in their own bedroom for naps, Travis would enjoy privileges equivalent to that of a human child from the very start of his new life. Because he was exclusively growing up amongst humans, Travis would go on to display exceptional social skills, exhibiting proficiency in tasks such as using keys, dressing himself, gardening, and even grooming horses. He was a regular presence at family meals at the tables, and would even get his own wine glass. And he had a love for ice cream so immense that he would go on to memorize the schedules of ice cream trucks. And as if all these activities weren't human enough, Travis would eventually develop the ability to use various forms of technology, things like looking through his favorite photos on a computer, or even watching his favorite TV shows for entertainment. And in addition to this already incredible list of his capabilities, Travis also held a passion for baseball and was even capable of operating a car. The Heralds went to great lengths to adapt their abode to suit the needs of a young and fast-growing chimpanzee. They constructed a spacious, secure chamber in the rear of the house, which featured a set of sliding doors that led to an outdoor pen. And to ensure the safety of the household, they installed a sturdy, lockable metal door on the entrance of their bedroom, thereby creating a small suite of rooms, inclusive of the cage chamber, where Travis would get to roam around freely when left unsupervised. And when Sandy and Jerome were present, Travis would be granted unrestricted access to the entire space, where he would crawl on his knuckles from the living room couch to the kitchen, swinging from the tires and ropes in his room, right on to his bed. And although the Heralds placed a mattress on the floor of their bedroom, they would on most nights allow Travis to come sleep with them on their bed, adding to just how much like an actual human the family viewed him as. Travis would quickly become a beloved figure in the community due to his exceptional social skills and lovable demeanor. His fame would continue to grow as he would work on various commercials and television shows as an animal actor, including Coca-Cola ads and appearances on popular programs such as The Maury Povich Show and The Man Show, captivating the hearts of millions across the nation. 
Occasionally, Sandra's now closest friend, Sharla, would drop by for a visit, accompanied by her daughter, Brianna. They would often spend time at Sandra's sitting outside, and Sharla would play with Travis while he would clamber all over her, fiddling with her long blonde hair, after which they would all take a picture together as a souvenir for that day's visit. What Sandra considered the happiest times of her life would unfortunately be short-lived when in September of 2000, her only daughter Sue would tragically pass away in a car accident. As a result of her daughter's untimely demise, Sandra would understandably grow even closer to Travis. As time went on, for the most part, Travis really did help Sandra with the grieving process, and although he was quickly growing, he would during this time pose no problems to her or anyone, at least for the next three years. Come 2003, however, the first sign of trouble would present itself, when an incident occurred that would cause Travis to react aggressively as Sandy was driving with him to the family tow shop. Someone happened to walk by and throw a bottle into the car, causing Travis to unbuckle his seatbelt, jump out, and lunge at a passerby. He would then roll around in the middle of the road and climb on cars and even chase police officers who'd been called to the scene. Despite repeated attempts to lure him back to the car, Travis would keep jumping out and causing chaos for several hours before finally tiring and climbing back into the car on his own. The police, who were familiar with Travis due to his popularity, would eventually write the incident off as playful behavior. Two years after this incident, Sandy would be devastated to find out that her husband has been diagnosed with stomach cancer and would tragically pass away just days later. His death would once again lead Sandra into a deep depression and would cause her to lean on Travis for emotional support, just as she had when Sue passed. It's important to keep in mind that an adult chimpanzee has strength equivalent to that of four or more men. This is mainly because their muscles contain more fast twitch fibers compared to humans. And despite the fact that Travis was well socialized, it was also well known that he was still a chimp. And if he ever were to snap, then he would be a real force to be reckoned with especially considering his raging hormones as he reached adulthood. These very real concerns would lead Sandra to being contacted by wildlife authorities about the potential danger of continuing to keep Travis as a pet. But of course, like a mother coming to the defense of her child, Sandra would convince them that Travis wasn't at all prone to violence and that he was different than the other chimps, confident that she could handle him if things ever did go south. Not long after Jerome's death, Sandra would secure Sharla a job at her towing company, and she would also give her the keys to the apartment that Jerome had built for Sue, rent-free, as not only were the pair like sisters at this point, but the recently widowed Sandra was clearly craving company. And so Sandra would finally get a much-needed fresh start, and life would begin looking up again. Sharla would often visit Sandra and Travis, and would even babysit him sometimes, although she admittedly never quite felt 100% safe around the powerful chimp. It's February 16th of 2009, and the now 14-year-old Travis has naturally grown to become vastly different from the adorable baby chimp that everyone had once been accustomed to. Standing at 5 feet tall and weighing in at a staggering 240 pounds, Travis was now spending most of his days indulging in junk food and watching TV, much like a human couch potato would, except this was a chimp that was much more physically capable than of course a sedentary human being would be. Sandra returns home from work to notice that Travis is unusually disturbed and detached on this day. He wasn't showing any interest in watching TV, neither was he responding to activities that would typically excite him. Instead, he snatches a set of car keys and begins to frantically run around the cars in the yard, begging to be taken for a drive like a spoiled child. Concerned with his hyperactive behavior, Sandra proceeds to give Travis a Xanax tablet by slipping it into a cup of tea. Xanax is a short-acting tranquilizer usually prescribed for panic disorders and anxiety. It has been controversially used on wild animals, especially in captivity, for decades. And although the practice is often looked down upon by many, it still occurs in many parts of the world till this very day. With no changes in his behavior, a concerned Sandra would then call Sharla and inform her of the situation, requesting that she come help her contain Travis. Sharla would arrive at Sandra's property around 3.40 p.m., and just as she opens the iron gate and makes her way to the front of the house, she then sees Travis standing about 35 feet away from her. 
She then takes a red Elmo doll, which she had brought along with her, and holds it over her face, playfully. Which is precisely when, for an unknown reason, Travis would suddenly snap and fly into a fit of rage, proceeding to full-on charge at Sharla, powerfully knocking her into her car and to the ground. He would then proceed to maul her relentlessly. Despite Sandra's desperate pleas for him to stop, the mauling was so brutal that Sandra literally thought Sharla was being eaten alive in front of her very eyes. Travis then goes on to use his powerful canines to rip and eat Sharla's whole face off, as well as multiple fingers while simultaneously inflicting severe bites and lacerations to multiple parts of her torso. Fearing for her own life at this point, a helpless Sandra runs back into the house, grabs a kitchen knife, rushes back out, and begins to stab Travis around his back repeatedly. This action would cause Travis to briefly stop and look at Sandra for a moment in a state of shock and confusion, after which he would go on to continue the assault, regardless of his stab wounds. It's at this point that a horrified Sandra jumps into one of her cars, knife in hand, and makes the fateful 911 call heard across the nation. Once the police finally do arrive, an enraged Travis would charge at one of their vehicles, breaking the driver's side mirror, at which point the officer inside the car shoots him four times, causing him to run off, after which he would shortly after fall to the ground and finally perish. Despite her gruesome injuries and the myriad of major physical challenges that this horrific incident posed to her life, Charlotte's remarkable emotional and mental resilience have allowed her to not only persevere through a long and arduous road to recovery, but are qualities of her that stand as a beacon of strength for the millions who've heard and been inspired by her incredible story of survival. One specific attack that I really wanted to talk about for some time now, and one that you definitely won't find in the public, was actually one that occurred with me. Now, in case y'all don't know, first of all, hi, my name is Animal Al. I cover stories about when animals attack humans, real life stories. In regards to this particular story, it happened to me when I was about five years old, and uh, I'm from East Africa, Tanzania, land of Simba and Mufasa. Right now, I currently live in Toronto, and I arrived here when I was 10 years old, uh, just a few years before that. My dad used to own this German Shepherd called Rex, and he was a guard dog, you know, and I was in a place called Dar es Salaam. It's uh, close to the capital of Tanzania, which is the Doma. And essentially, I was just a little carefree kid. You know, I had monkeys in the backyard and stuff like that, like um, at my house. And, you know, I, I was no stranger to wildlife. You know what I mean? Like, I, not only was I into like, you know, animal attack movies, I used to watch Jaws almost every week. I never really had a problem with dogs up until this particular experience, uh, which traumatized me for many years. My sister had actually gotten married at the time and she moved to a place called Upanga and she was there with my brother-in-law. They had two guard dogs. One was Rex and one was Laura. Now, I don't remember what breed Laura was, but I know Rex was a German Shepherd and he was a beast. Bred to guard, for real, right? Not just flocks of sheep. We're talking about like that thing can kill. Like I've heard things about Rex, you know what I mean? After the incident, once I was older. Yeah, that was a vicious dog. And Rex was vicious for good reason, because, you know, you're growing up in a third world country. Luckily, we were fortunate enough uh, to not go through those kinds of struggles. You know, we were healthy. We had a good home. We had two good homes and uh, we were living in an urbanized part of the city. But regardless of where you're living, you know, it's, it's still Africa. It's still Tanzania. It's still there's still it's not even a developing country yet. We can say it's still underdeveloped. So it's still in that third world stage. Having dogs like Rex or, you know, having security guards with guns or actually, we actually had a Maasai. Now, I'm not sure if you know what those are, but in case you don't, they're tribesmen, African tribes, you know, the ones that um, jump really high. They they have those um, uh, dances that they do around the fire and all that. Like it's it's uh, it's real, like they drink cow blood and whatnot. So we had Maasai's that we actually um, had one guarding our house with a spear. Now, you don't want to mess with Maasai's, you know what I mean? I feel like their bar mitzvah is like you know, killing a lion with a sphere when you're like 15, you know, then you're a man, you know, now, not all, not with all tribes, but I, I think that actually happens crazy enough. So I was just six, seven years, I was just six years old or so, maybe seven. 
And I remember I was going to my sister's house for the first time, uh, you know, after she got married. The guard opens the gates. I remember he was wearing like some green uniform or something, the night guard. And it was late at night, pitch dark. You know, it's a, it's, it's a big house, you know. And uh, so it had like a nice metal gate entrance and all that. And so we go in through the gates. And I still remember this, you know, because it was such a traumatizing experience. My dad's like, Ali, make sure you don't step out of the car right now. Don't step out of the car. And then he mumbled something. And I think he said something about a dog. I don't remember. I was like six. But right when he said that, you know, I, I didn't listen. You know, I wasn't listening to what he was saying. I was just kind of focused on the house and how beautiful it looked. You know, I remember it had really nice plants outside and uh, it was it was a, it was a big house. You know, my sister and her husband, you know, they had good careers and they had a good life. Uh, so the house was just so, so nice. And I was just like, as a kid, I was just like, I can't wait to go in. It's so big. And I remember for some reason, the door was unlocked. If anything, my dad, that was his only mistake. He should have locked the door, right? But I just kind of just opened the door so fast and I just started running towards the house. And as I did that, I remember turning around and I see the guard. I, I see the guard with the with the dog and it's a, it's like a he's holding it on a chain or whatever, like a big rope or whatever. So just as I'm looking at all this, and remember, this is a fully grown German Shepherd, right? And I'm just a six-year-old boy. And suddenly, Rex is off his leash. Somehow, he was able to get off the leash from the guard. Like, I think he was just way too strong. He was way too aggressive at the time. His adrenaline was pumping because he thought I was an intruder. I'm not going to blame the dog, but... So all I remember was it started chasing me full speed. And instead of going towards... And I was going towards the door of the house. Instead of going towards the door of the house, I instead turned left and started running in circles because there wasn't enough room for me to just go full out sprint. And I remember the chase lasted a few seconds. It was all it was quite a blur, but all I remember was when I turned around once and I saw the dog chasing me, like I couldn't believe how I was running like the flash. Like I actually for a few seconds was out running that dog. Maybe it was the maneuvering in circles that maybe, uh, you know, definitely had something to do with it, I think. Uh, but they're pretty they're pretty agile, though. They can go in circles pretty well. So I don't know, something or the other, my fight or flight, you know. But I was able to stay away from the dog for some time. But it was just probably just a couple seconds, you know what I mean? I thought it was longer, but Rex lunges at me and grabs a nice little chunk off my ass. I remember it hurting, it felt like burning, you know what I mean? Because it was maybe the air hitting it or whatever. But I remember, yeah man, I have some like, you know, like permanent Harry Potter scars on my ass, you know, because of this uh, German Shepherd. And luckily it didn't take off too much meat, you know, so there's no like uh, physical deformity. But re regardless, you guys probably want to know how that German, sh how the attack stopped. Uh, so before I ramble on, as the attack is happening, as I think Rex was about to start biting me, you know, he was clawing at, you know, my ass, basically. Maybe he did bite me a little bit. I'm not sure. But I had a couple marks over there. And um, can't show you, you know, YouTube censored. But regardless, you know, like, I'm not trying to show my ass on camera. So then Rex was off me. And I remember getting back up to my feet. I ran, I ran into the house. My sister came out and she's just like, what happened? What happened? And I'm like, I got bitten. The dog bit me. The dog bit me. He's like, which dog? Who, who, who was it? What happened? I'm like, Rex... So then I remember my uh, my brother-in-law comes out and then he starts treating me, put like some ointment and all that stuff. And uh, the next day, I remember going to the hospital and receiving rabies shots. And that's because that dog was always out. And I believe they just they had just gotten Rex. I'm not 100 percent sure. But for some reason, I remember getting the rabies shot, which I which I thought actually you get in your stomach. But I got it in my ass. So, you know, my ass took a pounding pause those couple of days. So anyways, that was the attack. But, you know, I felt horrible and I never had anything, you know, against the animal. Even when I was little, I just had this like phobia of dogs for like a good 15 years after that. It was actually pretty bad. Um, it would tra traumatize me pretty hard, you know, and now I'm okay around dogs. Um, you know, it took a while for that, though. But what's really sad is, yeah, like I was saying, after all this time, I found out that Rex actually was bitten by a venomous snake. Uh, we're not sure if it was a puff adder or a black mamba, uh, but uh, it was a highly venomous snake and he, he, he passed away a few years after uh, the incident.
And essentially, yeah, that's pretty much it. There are a few more stories when it comes to Africa and animal attacks. And you know what? I'm going to touch on them next video. But uh, other than that, I just wanted to make this video. You know what I mean? It's a dog attack. It, it could have been it could have been worse, right? I, I could have been hurt even more. Uh, luckily, that didn't happen. And so, yeah, I just wanted to let you guys know about the only animal attack that I've ever, uh, you know, personally experienced. If there are any animal attacks that have occurred with you, uh, then I would love to know uh, about them. Do comment down below and I'll read each and every one of them. I, I do read each and every one of your comments. Sometimes it's hard to reply, especially because the channel has been growing so fast. I really appreciate all you guys. Once again, stay tuned. You know, the channel is going to keep on getting better and uh, more content to come uh, that's, you know, different. Uh, you know, I know I, I, I go for animal attack stories all the time. We've been kind of going with story by story. And I know you love those, but at the same time, I love the genre. I think it has a lot of potential in terms of just how diverse the content can get. Uh, you know what I mean? We can talk about safety tips. We can talk about how to survive animal attacks. We can talk about uh, animal attack movies, which is an, uh, which is something that I want to cover as well. Like the most realistic ones. What are the best animal attack movies, shark attack movies, bear attack movies, you name it. Uh, so other than that, love y'all. Be safe. This is Animal Al. Peace. If this episode piqued your interest, then our previous episode about a gruesome great white shark attack that was captured on film during a documentary shoot is likely to do the same. You can find it on the end screen of this video.